To take English 435 Modern Canadian Theatre for upper level university credit, please contact the Open Learning Agency at these numbers. And then Vina said, So call my agent. I can't come in today. She's too busy. Theater sports? Theater isn't a sport. It's an art. It's a craft. It's a business. Oh, yeah, but it has to be worked at. It has to be polished, perfected. You can't just go out on the stage and make things up. I don't know. Improvisation's been pretty important in the development of Canadian theater, you know. Uh, some of the best work of companies like Theater Pass Marai and Tamanus came out of collective improvisation in the 1970s. Theater sports is just another phase in the evolution of improvisational theater in Canada, and it's a lot of fun. Theater isn't fun, it's work. Yeah, well, we're gonna have a lot more work today, the two of us, without Vina here. Which is why we are grateful for the Canadian Workshop Studio Lab Theater Ensemble volunteers, the Eager Beavers. We've even got buttons made up for them. <clears throat> Excuse me, I was looking for somebody named Jerry Wasser person. Wasserman? Wasserman. I'm Jerry Wasserman. My name's John. John, hi. hi. This is John, hi. too. Hi, John. We're Ooh, really nice glad hi. you're nice here today. Nice Listen, yeah. Yeah. because we've got an incredibly busy show. We have a feature on Vancouver Sun Theatre critic Barbara Crook. We've got Vina Sood's piece on theater sports, theater sports. <laughs> which is why she's not here today. And we've even got an interview lined up with John Gray, the playwright. Well, actually, although yeah. to, to tell you the truth, I, you're I, I, an I, I, eager I, beaver. I know. And we've got a button especially for you. And I have to tell you, we are very grateful for the commitment of people like you. We couldn't do it without you. Now. We're out of coffee, so for your very first task today, why don't you go up to the concession and get us a couple of coffees, yeah. John? Cream and two sugars. Cream and two sugars. Yeah. Just milk for me. Just milk? Thank you, sir. Okay, Jerry. Sure. Anyway, I think the real reason Vina's not with us today is because she's annoyed about Billy Bishop. Oh, did he break up with her? Billy Bishop goes to war. John Gray's play, the show that we're doing this week, She's ticked off because there's no part in it for her. You know, it's essentially a one-man show. One actor plays all 15 parts, John. You're that actor. Except I don't play the piano player. Right. That's the part John Gray himself played in the original production with Eric Peterson. The guy on Street Legal. That's right. Only this was long before Street Legal. And before John Gray became a celebrity, before he did his satirical music videos on the journal. Gray and Peterson actually began collaborating around 1970 when Gray graduated from UBC with a degree in directing and he and some pals decided to form their own theater. That was Tamanus, right? That's right. It came from a Chilcotin Indian word meaning magic. Larry Lillo was part of that company, and so was Eric Peterson. I didn't know all those guys were from BC. Well, actually, none of them was. Lillo was from Alberta, Peterson from Saskatchewan, and Gray from Nova Scotia. But it was the 60s, so they all headed west and ended up on the coast. Yeah. Tamanus did some great shows back then. Oh, they did. Very intense, very artistic, very political. I remember their version of the Bakai. Free love, left-wing politics, nudity, martial arts. I still have my free Dionysus button from 1972. The company wrote and improvised a lot of their shows collectively, and they all lived together in what used to be called a hippie house. John Gray directed most of the shows. Tamanus is still around now, but uh, Gray and Peterson aren't part of it. Nope, they both went off to Toronto after a few years, and they joined Theatre Pass Marai which was probably the most important company in Canada in the early 70s, under director Paul Thompson. Now, Thompson was an avid nationalist who believed in creating plays about the world his audiences lived in. Local history, using all the resources of his talented acting company, of which Eric Peterson quickly became the star. Thompson would have each actor do research, then improvise the material that became the scenes of the play. Yeah, isn't Thompson the... Uh Director who said, uh, if uh, one of my actors can doodle, you can be sure they'll be doodling in the show? Yodel, actually. Uh, excuse me? Yeah, he said, if one of my actors could yodel, he'd be yodeling in the show. I mean, sometimes if he couldn't yodel, he'd be yodeling in the show. Uh, anyway, the Passmerai Collective became famous for their plays about Canadian life, like The Farm Show, Duke of Bores, and 1837, The Farmer's Revolt. John Gray was writing lyrics for these shows. Music, mostly. Yes, well, John, uh, 
since you're so fond of music and since you're such a strapping lad. Strapping? Why don't huh? you uh, go upstairs to the stage and, and help move the piano? Move the show. piano? Well, John Carroll and to I set up Billy Bishop for the viewers. Look, John, John, I'm John, John. To be some of us are talkers and some of us are workers. You strapping lads have to hew the wood and draw the water, build the dams, move the pianos, while we artist types tell the stories, make the music, celebrate the spirit. John, hey, go. Celebrate the spirit. Uh, didn't uh, Peterson and Gray meet Billy Bishop when they were touring with a Passmarai show? Well, not exactly, John. You see, Bishop himself was long dead in 1976 when Gray and Peterson came across Bishop's book, Winged Warfare, about his World War I experiences as a fighter pilot. Now, everybody knew about Eddie Rickenbacker, the American ace, and of course, the Red Baron, but the Canadian pilot who had shot down 72 enemy planes, compared to Rickenbacker's 26, for example, was like most Canadian heroes, relatively obscure and uncelebrated. Gray and Peterson, in the best Passmarai tradition, set out to change that. So, how did the show come together? How did it get to be such a phenomenon? Well, John Gray wrote the script, and Peterson improvised around it. Impro... Oh, I can't believe that. Improvisation? No oh, way. Theater sports! Huh. You know, whatever happened to the lonely writer in his garret? We will let John Gray tell that part of the story himself, and how the play became such a phenomenon, if he ever shows up. Now, while we go upstairs to introduce the play, we're going to let you have a look at Venus' theater sports piece to see how improvisational theater continues to thrive in Vancouver. Humbug. How long have you guys been coming down to theater sports? Years and years. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Years and years, seriously, like how many years? Three, four, five? Five. Five years? Every night. It's been great. Oh, this is my first time. Great, so you don't know anything that you're gonna see tonight? Not a thing. My friends rave about it, and I'm here to see what's happening. You came all the way from Australia for Just this? Just to see theatre sports, yeah, absolutely. I heard all about it, so I flew right over to catch the next show. Theatre sports, it's just that, a combination of theatre and sport. Invented and originated in Calgary in 1978 by Keith Johnstone and members of the Loose Moose Theatre Company. And what is it? Well, it's where teams of actors jump out on the stage with nothing rehearsed, get a suggestion from the audience, and make up a scene right there on the spot. Actors insult each other, they make faces, and generally misbehave and leap before they look. And the sport aspect comes into it when judges award points to the teams of actors, and by the end of the night, the team with the most points wins the game. So let's see here tonight what we've got in the world of improvisation. Come on, come on. 106 ways to jump a fence. All right. stories can be developed into full-length plays. The crew member for this month okay. is... Let me guess, don't show me. Getting a very strong vibration. There he is! The improvised crew member of the month. Well, that was a sample of theater sports with the audience as the author. So let's go downstairs now, talk to the actors when they're down in the green room and see if they had a good mental floss. You're on stage and you're, you're in the middle of a scene. You know, is there anything that's happening in your mind? Are you, are you sort of thinking about anything? Are you deciding what to do next? Oh, yeah. It, uh, it's funny, actually. It never gets any easier. I'm always, uh, I'm still always really quite nervous sometimes. Uh, and uh, basically, you sit there desperately trying to think of how you can uh, fit in, or especially when people on stage your pals or your teammates are, are dying. <laughs> That's usually actually when your brain tends to dry up. It's really unfortunate that way. So you, you watch them, you go, I should really get out there and help them out. <laughs> I haven't a clue what I could do or say to, to, to rescue them. Theater sports scenes are disposable. They're, um, 
like with us, we did a scene tonight that was really funny about jumping over fences. That if you did it again, I think the audience would go, "What the hell? What's that about?" You know, because there's just something that is inexplicable that makes it funny often. And it's also the fact that the audience knows that you have no idea what you're doing. And if you do scripted comedy, the audience expects that you do know what you're doing. So you kind of have to change it a bit. <laughs> he's not finished his job yet. So he's dead. So what? That's right. Don't say anything about being alive and jumping over that. <laughs> Switch off. Switch off. Petrol on. Petrol on. Switch on. Switch on. Contact. Contact. Before we ever see Billy Bishop, the crack flyer and scourge of the German Luftwaffe, we meet him as the small town Canadian boy from Owen Sound, Ontario. And the worst student royal military college ever had. But when the war broke out in 1914, they were pretty desperate. They made me an officer. That was in the Mississauga horse. And after a number of false starts, which the accident-prone bishop tells us about via letters to his girlfriend, Margaret... Thinking of you constantly, Margaret, I remain... He finally leaves for England. Aboard the good ship Caledonia, which soon changed its name to the good ship Vomit. Eventually, the Caledonia, latrine of the Atlantic, made it through to Portsmouth, full of dead horses and uh, sick Canadians. This first part of the play reflects the naivete of Bishop's youth and the first blush of Canadian wartime pride and patriotism epitomized in the song that Bishop and the piano player sing. We were off to fight the Hun. We would shoot him with a gun. Our medals would shine like a saber in the sun. We were off to fight the Hun, and it looked like lots of fun. Somehow it didn't seem like war at all, at all, at all. Somehow it didn't seem like war at all. But the romance wears off quickly for Bishop in the mud and muck of the English camp, where one day he sees his first plane. Suddenly, out of the clouds, comes this little single-seater scout. The pilot circles a couple of times, then lands on an open space like a dragonfly on a rock. He's in this long sheepskin coat, warm and dry. What a beautiful picture. But I'm Canadian. I'm cannon fodder. You practically have to own your own plane to get into the Royal Flying Corps. That's what Bishop complains to a drunken Cockney officer he meets in a bar one night. Au contraire, mate, au contraire. The upper classes are depressed by the present statistics, so they aren't joining with their usual alacrity. Now, anyone who wants to can get blown out of the air, even Canadians. And eventually, Bishop gets his chance, interviewing for the job with an ancient British officer. Here's Eric Peterson himself doing that scene in the NFB film, Stages. So, you wish to transfer to the RFC? Eh? Am I right? Am I correct? Oh, yes, sir. I, uh, I, I, I want to be a fighter pilot, sir. No, I see, I see, I see. Well, that's, that's, that's most commendable, Bishop. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> My mother always wanted it, sir. <laughs> Eric Peterson is in final rehearsal. In two days, he and John Gray will open on Broadway with their play about Billy Bishop, Canada's World War I hero. Oh, I see. <laughs> Deep a understand. bad boy. <laughs> the mother's trying to get rid of you. Oh, I see. Yes, yes. <coughs> well, situation is this, Bishop. We need good men for the RFC, but they must have the correct... Uh, uh, Qualifications, yes. Now, while the war office is not yet ascertained, indeed, what qualifications are necessary for flying a... Uh, for flying a... Uh, 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 the aeroplane, yes. <laughs> they frighten the horses, you know. <laughs> they frighten the horses, you know. So Bishop gets to fly as an observer, but he buggers things up terribly with his typical lack of savoir faire. Luckily, his career is salvaged by a family friend, the redoubtable Lady St. Helier, one of Eric Peterson's greatest comic creations. Bishop, I am Lady St. Helier, reform alderman, poetess, 
friend of Churchill and the woman who shall save your life. She sings him a song about the weakness of his colonial mentality, but she also understands that the colonial's vitality and eagerness to please can help the British win the war. So she arranges for Bishop to become a pilot. We see him experience his first solo flight. Greatest day in a man's life. And then his first dogfight and his first kill. I throw my stick forward and dive on the hunt. I keep him in my sights till he completely fills the lens. <laughs> what a feeling as he flips on his back and falls out of control. I keep firing into the tumbling hun. <laughs> he just crashes into the earth and explodes in flames. <laughs> I pull back on the stick, level out, screaming at the top of my lungs. I win! I win! I win! Billy's first triumph is also the first sign of the bloodlust he'll develop. The loss of that sweet Canadian innocence as he transforms into an efficient killing machine. He crash lands in no man's land and he sees the graphic horror of the trenches. Later he shoots down a German plane and sees two flyers fall past him, still alive. Neither of these scenes slows him down for more than a moment though. For he learns very quickly that in war there's only one rule, survival as he sings to us in the voice of the French chanteuse, the lovely Hélène. So when you fight, stay as calm as the ocean and watch what's going on behind your shoulder. Remember, war is not the place for deep emotion and maybe you'll get a little older. Quickly his kills mount and his mood darkens. Dearest Margaret, it is the merry month of May, and today I sent another merry Hun to his merry death. How I hate the Hun. He has killed so many of my friends. I enjoy killing him now. I go up as much as I can, even on my day off. My score is getting higher.